Joe, well, look, we might get started. Uh, a big hello and welcome to everybody joining us from around the country for this RSM economic update. I'm Jamie O'Rourke, the Chief Executive Partner of RSM Australia, and I'm delighted to have you all with us today. Well, there's certainly been a lot of economic activity since we hosted our last economic update in August of last year. At that time, there's still much talk in Australia and around the world of avoiding a recession, or at least avoiding a hard landing. Uh, since that time, we've brought on board our own Chief Economist, Devika Shavitika. And so Devika, as the RSM Australia Communist, Economist in this role, is following the key macroeconomic indicators, such as growth, inflation, central bank decisions, and the labour market, to assess the overall health of the economy. Devika has nearly 10 years' experience of macroeconomic research spanning both public and private sectors, including stints at the Reserve Bank of India and the Bank of America. Devika has also travelled to a number of the RSM offices throughout Australia, both in the metropolitan areas, the capital cities, and in the regional areas such as Mora in Western Australia and Toowoomba in, in regional Queensland and has plans to be out at Wagga and Albury uh, next month. Devika has invested a lot of time analysing the key industry sectors that we focused on at RSM to better understand the main levers and to advise our clients. And some of those will be touched on today. Uh, you may have read Devika's regular commentary in the financial and business press, including recently the AFR, Bloomberg and SBS. Our clients around Australia are experiencing challenges as they navigate through a great deal of uncertainty. And this has been the case since the beginning of COVID. And so part of our goal, our aim in having an economist in-house at RSM is to provide guidance and more certainty so that our clients' businesses can make decisions with more confidence. The Australian economy feels like it's in a bit of a holding pattern at the moment. It's been six months since the RBA last hiked interest rates, and inflation has definitely slowed, which is good, and we're all expecting rate cuts, with commentators disagreeing on when they would arrive. But sentiment has certainly changed very recently with the Fed in the US releasing lower than expected growth numbers and then closer to home last week or so, two pieces of key data were released which surprised us. The first was lower unemployment than expected and secondly, the higher inflation uh, that came through last week, higher than what was predicted by most commentators, including the RBA. And the main driver of this inflation is the services sector. So this put our mainstream economic advisors into a spin with the narrative moving from when to if we'd see a rate cut this year. The dispersion of views has become very wide with reputable economists such as Warren Hogan suggesting three rate hikes are possible by the end of this year. And then at the other end, equally uh, respected Shane Oliver from the AMP having a completely different and a more optimistic outlook. So that, that makes it more uncertain for businesses in Australia today. And when we think about what's coming up with a federal budget to be released in two weeks from today and the long awaited and revamped stage three tax cuts from 1 July with rising real wages and an uncertain global environment, this all adds to the complexity. So Devika will try to make sense of all of this and help us understand what it means so that we can make better decisions in our business. Ladies and gentlemen, the format for today is an interactive discussion. We've decided on no PowerPoint slides and we've received a number of questions in the lead up. So thank you very much to those who have contributed. And we would also welcome questions throughout the presentation and I'll try, try my best to manage them in the next, next hour or so. So Devik, maybe we could begin with an overview of the Australian economy. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Jamie, and thank you, everyone um, who has joined. Let me start off a bit with what's happening globally and then move to the national um, movement in the economy. Currently, the two things that are governing the global narrative are what's happening in China and what's happening in the Middle East. Um, over the last couple of months, we have seen that the real estate climate in China has been consistently deteriorating. Um, there's been a lot of focus on the fiscal side to inject stimulus into the real estate market to revive the sector. Um, but it's looking increasingly difficult to really get that side of the economy rolling to the pre-pandemic levels. Uh, we are, however, seeing a shift in China from the real estate market to what has been its traditional stronghold, which is the manufacturing sector. We are seeing more and more investment, more and more focus inside of China to develop its manufacturing sector. What that means broadly for Australia is that given China is our largest trade partner and one of the key drivers of commodity prices for us, we may see a shift um, in the demand for the traditional commodities, which is iron ore and coal, to something like lithium, because China is now pushing more and more towards the new energy vehicle market, manufacturing those um, more than perhaps focusing on the real estate market. So we could perhaps see a shift in the commodity focus coming from China to Australia. On the other side, we've got the geopolitical ramifications of the tensions in the Middle East. Um, unfortunately, the problems don't seem to be um, getting reduced. In fact, they're getting worse. And the risk is that it spills to the broader Middle East sector, which will include the oil producing countries. We are already seeing Brent crude prices continuously trend higher. Um, there's increased volatility on a day-to-day -day basis in uh, crude oil prices, which directly impacts what happens to petrol costs in, in Australia. So um, although the volatility is up, down, up, down, the overall broad trend for petrol prices has consistently been going up. Having said that, uh, if we look at the later part of 2024 and the whole year of 2025, um, there's been some positive um, outlook coming off of OECD. So the OECD has published that the overall economic, the growth forecast for the world looks more positive going into 2025. 2024 is still the year where we are coming off of um, some post-pandemic um, post geopolitical tension era where we can expect some delay in things to no sorry to normalize but that is going to happen in the second half of 2024 and we are going to see the results of better growth better prospects for economic development in the year of 2025 according to OECD Australia and India are the two countries which have significantly better prospects in 2025 compared to 2024 um Overall, world prospects also look better, but Japan is expected to remain as is. The United States and China are expected to see slightly muted growth compared to 2024, but it's not something that should be taken in a negative way. Uh, inflation overall is expected to moderate across all major key economies, India, Australia, Euro area, Japan, United States, as well as China. Um, for Australia, the OECD expects inflation to come down somewhere around the 3% mark, um, whereas Euro area, Japan, US, and China are expected to be slightly lower. India is, of course, expected to be slightly higher, but um, that's no surprise given the general trajectory of inflation in India. A 4% inflation rate is really not a bad picture. Coming closer home, focusing on Australia, I think the Australian economy overall has been unexpectedly resilient. We saw a growth of 0.2% quarter on quarter in the fourth quarter of 2023, which has taken the annual growth rate to 1.5%. We have increasingly delivered, we have in fact delivered on the expectations of a soft landing. Um, unfortunately, though, we are already in a per capita recession. Um, having said that, per capita recession can also be attributed to increased population growth. So it only remains to be seen how the growth metrics unfold in the coming quarters. Um, what helped us uh, avoid a hard landing is definitely excess savings during the pandemic and the high consumption post pandemic. We also had a very strong job market and some solid income gains, which 
meant that an average Australian was earning a steady income, so had a lot of disposable cash on hand, which meant there was a steady demand for goods and services, which kept the economic activity going. Inflation has peaked, uh, had peaked at 7.8% in December 2022, um, and it is currently sitting at 3.6% year on year. Trimmed mean inflation, which strips all the volatility, is sitting at 4% year on year. Goods prices are easing much faster than services, and the RBA's target is a midpoint of 2% to 3%. So what the RBA ideally desires is for inflation to come down to 2.5%, which it expects somewhere towards the beginning of 2026. Unemployment rate has been at multi-decade lows. We are currently... We, are, we have left the seasonal months behind us. So from November to February are usually highly seasonal months. What it means for the labor market is that a lot of people switch jobs, a lot of people go away on holidays, a lot of people have new job offers at hand, but they haven't really started their new jobs yet. So all of these factors feed into the unemployment metric, which means we may see some months showing very high unemployment rates when people are waiting to start a new job. But the moment they start a new job, unemployment rate sh uh, shoots down very sharply. Beginning March, we can expect the seasonality to be left behind. So the March print, the April print, May, June, as we go ahead in the year, we can actually start looking at the unemployment rate as a more solid data minus all the seasonality. Underutilization rate is on the rise in Australia, but wages growth are still within the RBA's target range pending productivity improvement. I'll touch upon that a bit later. We have seen some early signs of the labor market cooling um, led by record migration, but it remains to be seen um, how long the easing of the labor market actually, how long it takes for the easing to materialize. Overall, we have seen good growth and good inflation, but as of now, since the RBA started hiking from May 2022, both growth and inflation have been trending down. Um, inflation needs to trend down and growth is trending down, but we are still it's, it's good that we are avoiding a hard, um, a hard landing or what we call in simpler terms, a recession. What really drove good economic activity was high household savings rate. But since the RBA has started hiking, we saw that household savings ratios had fallen below pre-pandemic levels, which was below the 5% mark. However, over the last quarter, we saw that household savings ratios have again started picking up, which is a positive sign. What has led to this is there has been a lot of fiscal stimuli injected into the Australian economy. We are getting a lot of rebates for important sectors such as childcare, rent relief, electricity prices, which are muting the prices for uh, which are muting the costs for an ordinary Australian household. So all the excess cash that is being saved thanks to all the subsidies is going back into the savings pot. Um, this is a very good sign. Just after coming out of the pandemic and the extended lockdowns, we saw that people really went out and started spending a lot of money um, and all the excess spent up saving was circulated in the economy. The demand shot up the supply was not matching demand, which led us to the problem of inflation. But this time around, we are seeing that people are being really smart with their money. Household savings are <clears throat> actually being saved for a rainy day. They are aware that potentially the RBA may be pushing their cuts later and later in the year. And if inflation doesn't come back down under control sooner, there is a risk that the RBA might hike. So people are being really smart with how they're spending their money. Not only are they diverting excess cash to savings, they're also being very smart with their purchases. For example, over the last couple of um, months, we've seen that people are taking more and more advantages of um, discounts. So a good example is the Black Friday sale. And another good example is the end of fiscal, end of financial year, EOFI sale, which comes somewhere around June, July period. What are the biggest price constraints, I think, and what are the biggest challenges for the RBA? So 
we, you must have often heard Dr. Governor Michelle Bullock mention tradables inflation and non-tradables inflation. So tradables inflation is what we understand as imported inflation, whereas non-tradable inflation is something that is domestically driven. Demand-driven inflation is the primary concern of the RBA as of now, but at the same time, it is also mindful of what's happening outside of Australia. As I mentioned before, Brent crude prices, crude oil prices are the key drivers of petrol costs in Australia. And given that the trajectory for crude oil has been on the upside, we are seeing that uh, materialize at the Bowser in Australia. So an average Australian is paying more and more for fuel. Um, on the domestic side of things, over the last quarter, it was it was very it was very interesting to see how an average first home buyer in Australia was behaving. There was more and more talk of the RBA potentially cutting towards the end of the year, which prompted a lot of first home buyers to preempt that cut and enter the housing market sooner, assuming that when the RBA cuts, there'll be more competition in the market and more and more people would enter, which would drive up house prices. The downside being everyone thought exactly like this, which meant there was a lot of demand for people to ent who entered the housing market, pushed up the house prices because house prices, house prices, housing supply has been um, unfortunately quite low. These are the two biggest concerns that the RBA is facing that on the tradable and the non-tradable side. However, there's another challenge that the RBA looks at, and that is the labor market which also impacts the services side of inflation. So unemployment rate has been at multi-decade lows. We, can't, we are sitting at a 3.8% unemployment rate and underutilization rate has been persistently going up. By underutilization rate, we mean that any individual engaged in the labor market is not being utilized up to his or her full potential. Um, basically what that means is they're not operating at the optimum level, which will justify the wages they are being paid, which means productivity is low and labor input costs for businesses are higher. A common concern we've been hearing is that we are not finding good labor or we are not finding skilled labor. So note the shift in the commentary now. A couple of months back, we were hearing from businesses that they're finding it hard to find labor to fill the gaps, but now we are finding more and more concerns about finding skilled labor from the businesses. So with record migration, we have more or less solved the problem of absolute number of applications per job vacancy. We have now shifted to the structural side of the labor market, which means there is a mismatch in the skills that businesses are looking for and what the migrants are able to offer. Um, another another factor feeding into the inflation dynamics in Australia is, of course, wages, which is closely linked to the labor market as well. Um, for the first time in a very in almost three years, we have seen public sector wages outpace private sector wages. Private sector wages have historically featured greater in the compositional sense for the wages market in Australia, but this time around public sector wages in the fourth quarter of 2023 grew at 4.2%, whereas private wages have grown 4.1%. Mostly the public sector wages have been driven by enterprise agreement and awards. Awards include the Fair Works Commission, um, the minimum wages uh, revisions upward revisions to minimum wages, as well as enterprise agreements where we have um, some set uh, wage metrics depending on the industry you're in. Individual, agree uh, individual arrangements are the third side of the wage agreement schedule, which is more for people engaged in employment like you and me, uh, where you are a market hire you sit together with your potential employer before starting your job and you sit down and you negotiate a wage that works best for both of you. What does all this mean for the RBA? So what's happening is RBA has been behind the curve compared to its global peers. Uh, we are currently sitting at 4.35%, whereas we've got the Fed, the BOC, the RBNZ, and all the other central banks move past the 5% mark. We were late to the party. We started hiking much later compared to the other economies, and we are sitting quite low. But we have to understand that each central bank thinks 
in line with what's best for their um for what's best for their country. To give you a simple example, if we were to compare the US Fed with the RBA, uh, the transmission of the monetary policy hikes directly to an average American household is very low because most of the US households have a 30-year fixed mortgage payment, whereas in Australia, every single hike that the RBA does is immediately translate, is immediately uh, passed on to the customers, which means the pain is much higher for an average Australian versus an average American. This is something the RBA is mindful of, which is one of the reasons that um, it is being quite slow and mindful in the pace of its hikes. Um, also, uh, what the RBA does care about is how does it impact businesses? Every time the RBA hikes, the costs are transferred to businesses. And as it is when it's facing a situation of high labor input costs, high uh, raw material costs, and added cost of capital only increases the problems for the economy. Our base case is for the RBA to pivot in the month in the third quarter of this year, uh, definitely not sooner, but there are some risks. There are some upside risks as well as downside risks. And we are now seeing more, the upside risks materialize more than the downside risks. I'll just quickly give you a run through. On the downside, if there's a faster decline in inflation and household consumption weakness persists longer than expected despite fiscal stimulus, then the RBA may be forced to cut preemptively. However, if inflation takes longer to return to target than anticipated, which is actually what is happening right now, inflation expectations could drift upwards, which means we can expect people to think that, okay, inflation is going to be at this rate for longer. Maybe we should negotiate higher prices with our employers. Once that happens, it creates a system called wage price spiral. What that means is people expect inflation to be higher. They negotiate higher wages. It means it's higher labor costs for businesses, which means revenue falls down. So the structural un unemployment will also result in sustained wage pressures. And this is exactly what the RBA wants to avoid. It does not want a price wage spiral situation where everyone has assumed that inflation is going to stay higher for longer. On the international side of things, China weakness obviously plays very heavily into the RBA's considerations, as does the geopolitical tension because high tradable inflation risks is predominantly out of the RBA's control. Thanks. I'm ready to take questions, Jamie. Thanks, Devika. That's a, a great overview. Uh, we've um, covered a lot of lot of territory in that, so we might use the questions <laughs> to unpack some of the the, the key areas of interest. Uh, so, yeah. look, the first question really, and you mentioned that we've got a, a, a new Reserve Bank a governor uh, in Michelle Bullock, but what indicators does the Reserve Bank of Australia consider in assessing a decision to change interest rates? And there's a second part of the question. What indicators should they consider that are not currently being considered, if any? Okay. Thanks, Jamie. That's a good question. I would say there aren't any indicators that the RBA should consider, which it already isn't considering. Um, it has a... Look, RBA has a dual mandate of managing inflation and maintaining full employment. Managing inflation by extension also works towards bringing stability to the AUD. Apart from these, the RBA also looks at global economic developments, such as actions of other peer central banks, geopolitical tensions, and its implications on the Aussie economy. Some of the other data, which do not directly flow into the decision making, but are keenly observed, include the consumer sentiment surveys, house prices, and as well as responses to the RBA's business liaison surveys. Um, sorry, Jamie, can't hear you. Uh, yeah. The second, the second questioner has asked for your view on, on his or her opinion that the main reason inflation seems to be sticky is the non-discretionary costs such as rent and insurance. That is, it's not excess consumption or demand by the general population. So, and as we know, and as you mentioned earlier, we're in a per capita recession. So how do you think the RBA views these factors in its decision making? Yeah. So, Jamie, for this, the RBA recognizes that factors such as population growth, demand for rentals, undersupply of housing are all structural challenges that monetary policy cannot fully address. 
Moreover, the spike in insurance costs due to an uncertain environment um, or an unforeseen event like a pandemic, it just further complicates the inflation outlook. By understanding the limitations it faces in addressing certain aspects of economic performance, the RBA tries to work around these factors. So for decision-making, it prefers to hold a long-term view on such things. Thank you. Um, Devika, you did say earlier that your, your base case is that there will be a rate cut in Q3. So that means pre-September. But you also said, uh, which is a bit of get-out-of-jail comment, that uh, th with the inflationary pressures, it may not occur. So, can we actually pin you down to uh, to a to a to a month? So, when when do you think interest rates will start to come down? When will be that first rate cut? Yes. So, recent developments in the U.S. have emphasized the need for caution, particularly in the last stages of combating inflation. Uh, especially in Australia, where significant rebates are keeping actual prices quite muted. Um, I feel our easing cycle is going to be extremely conservative. And the base case is for the first pivot in third quarter. And I mean the tail end of the third quarter, which is the month of September. I do not expect any time before that. And with an increased chance of that being pushed into the fourth quarter. But if, if I were to say a month in the fourth quarter, it would be November. Uh, the RBA doesn't uh, will not be meeting in October and December is the holiday season. So I would like to believe the RBA wouldn't like to pass on some pain if it does decide to do that. Uh, however, it will be a good time to have the first cut uh, in November. So that's a good start to the holiday season. So either ways, um, my best guess is if if the pivot is pushed out of the third quarter to the fourth quarter, it moves from September to November. Okay, and so to be clear, you're expecting, based on the data to date, one one rate cut between now. Yes, and yes, yeah. no more rate cuts than one for this year, for this calendar year. Yeah, and um, Devika, they often say that when the US sneezes, the world catches the cold. Australia's uh, <laughs> not not immune from that statement. Um, do you think that a US rate cut will have a direct impact on Australian interest rates? Um. Okay, this this is interest. This is a tricky question, Jamie, because we cannot have a one is to one um, answer to this. Primarily because of the point I highlighted before, that um, the transmission of monetary policy to an average Australian household is much faster than that in the US. But if the Fed was to cut and the RBA was to hold longer, it would in general be good for a currency because of the interest rate differentials. So it'll, it'll make the AUD more attractive. Uh, however, having said that, I think the Fed would decide what's best for the US economy. And Governor Bullock, I think, would be resolute in doing what's best for Australia, even if the Fed decides to move before before the RBA does. Thank you. Thank you. And a, a further question is following on the RBA. Um, how will the future decisions of the RBA affect exporting to the US? Well, currency moves with each central bank decision, and it does impact overall trade dynamics. Uh, like I mentioned previously, lowering interest rates can stimulate exports by weakening the Aussie dollar, and it makes exports more competitive generally. So if the RBA does decide to pivot down, it would make Australian exports more competitive, more attractive, so we can expect um, greater demand for Australian goods and commodities. But if the RBA does decide to raise interest rates, it will have the opposite effect. Thank you. We might move, there's some questions that have come through on property. So what's your assessment on real estate prices, rental shortages and house prices in Australia? So Jamie, we've had a shortage of housing and we've seen an increase, a sharp increase in migration. And overall, it has shot up demand, which has driven up rental costs. The first quarter of 2024 inflation data, which came out just earlier this month, about 
last week saw that um, rental prices have grown 7.8% year on year, which is the strongest rise since first quarter 2009. And ongoing growth rental demand, ongoing growth in demand for rental market shows that it is extremely tight. Market expectations are also are for a 5% to 10% increase in home values for home buyers. And it is unlikely that prices, whether you look at the rental market or the housing prices, it is unlikely that prices are going to come down anytime soon. Um, post pandemic, I think another problem that needs to be highlighted is that post pandemic, the gap between building approvals and commencements has also widened. Before, what typically took anywhere between three to six months from approval to commencements now takes 12 months on average. Um, add to the mix, we have builder insolvencies in the face of increased input costs for raw materials and lack of labor availability, which has all you know, combined together worsened the crisis in the residential market. Uh, William Bass has posted one on, on the questions to round property. Household confidence has been consistently low for an extended time now. Are you seeing this changing into 2025? Uh, so look, household confidence is increasingly linked to what happens, um, what the RBA does, primarily because most of the average Australian is currently holding a mortgage. So every time the RBA increases interest rates, it means there's more pain for an average Australian, higher mortgage repayments, and add to the fact that inflation is coming down slower. So it's a matter of whether the RBA wants to rip the bandaid off quickly or we just try to do it slowly. Um, depending on what side of the camp you are on, um, the answer might differ. If the households, however, I feel need to be prepared for some more pain at least till the third quarter of this year because we know for a fact that things are not going to normalize quickly. And Come mid, mid calendar year, which is June, July, when we have the budget, when we have the stage three tax cuts, that's when we are likely to see some shift in consumer confidence because we are already aware the governor is looking to add some cost of relief measures in the budget. And we also are aware that the impending revisions to the stage three tax cuts are going to um, increase disposable cash for an average Australian household. However, we have to understand what's on the other side of the coin. If this increase in cash risks reversing the progress we have made on inflation and forces the RBA's hand to hike interest rates more, it means you have rebates, but you also have additional RBA hikes. So net-net, it might just offset each other. So going into 2024, I think consumer confidence, consumer sentiment is going to be fairly uh, muted, but we can expect some pickup going into calendar year 2025. Thank you, Devika. And our own National Head of Property and Construction, Adam Crowley, has a question on where interest rates are going over the next two years because the cost of capital has that a significant mm -hmm. impact on the property development sector? So interest rates are definitely coming down over the two-year horizon, which will bring down the cost of capital uh, for businesses, not just in the construction sector, but otherwise as well. Market expectations for the next 12 months, as you highlighted um, at the beginning, Jamie, are quite varied, with some participate, uh, participants expecting more hikes, some delaying their cuts. Um, but I believe this... Um, I think this this difference in the narratives is predominantly because we are in a transitionary phase between a hiking and a cutting cycle. Therefore, it requires more patience. Um, we saw what happened in the US. The Fed was quite vocal about uh, beating inflation fast and perhaps starting cuts as soon as June, but data didn't come in line with what they were expecting. So I think it's very important to be dynamic. Having said that, this year, I do not expect more than one cut, um, but over the next two years, we can expect the RBA to come somewhere around 3.85% mark to 3.6%, Come in, bring the interest rates down to the 3.6% towards the tail end of 2025. I Thank think, you. yeah, I think uh, 
we'll have more clarity once we have the inflation data of the second quarter of this year, as well as the budget policies to evaluate better. That will be good for the property sector. Mm. Uh, and a, a question from Campbell Gordon. The, to the extent inflation and therefore rates remain higher for longer, what should the federal government do? So not the RBA, but what should the federal government do to manage inflation given the baby boomers are a big driver of demand now and they're not impacted by rate rises? Um, well, that's that's a very interesting question. And um, I think it's... This might lead to some very uncomfortable discussions, and uh, <laughs> but um, let me put it as objectively as possible. So, unfortunately, what happens is there are only so many investment avenues in Australia. So, predominantly, most of the Australians tend to invest in the housing market. The baby boomers are ones who perhaps are most most than most of them than not are mortgage free. They have not one, but many investment properties, um, and they are reaping the benefits of a higher interest rate environment where it does not impact them directly, but it definitely pushes up the value of their equity, uh, particularly when we are in the market seeing undersupply of housing and rising demand for housing. Um, something I think is very, what is very state specific, I would like to mention is the land tax that we are seeing in Victoria. What the state government is doing there is it's trying to earn more revenue to fulfill the government purses by targeting land taxes. And how I see it is it's twofold. Number one, when it targets people with more property, um, with, ad with additional number of properties, what it's trying to do is make it so expensive for people to invest in more than one property that number one, either they give up that property, they sell it so there's more availability of housing, or they end up paying more tax, which means all the fiscal subsidy that is going into making the life of an average Victorian easy is they are able to deliver on that by generating revenue from the people who are not necessarily feeling the pain. So this is this is really tricky. The, the interest rates definitely are a pain point for the young Australians, not so much for the baby boomers, but perhaps downsizing to um, a lower, a, a smaller apartment might be a good way, might be, maybe the federal government can make it, can incentivize baby boomers to downsize in order to solve all these problems so the youngsters can actually get into the housing market. The baby boomers are untouched, are happy, um, still living a good life. Uh, but overall, it's... <laughs> It really, it really, the, the, the right answer really depends on which side of the camp you are on, so. Thank you, David. No, that's enough. And, and look, Adrian Hunter did have a question on land tax in Victoria, and you, you provided a, a good overview of what the government okay. in Victoria is trying to accomplish by that. But what impact do you think that'll have on Victorian property prices? Um, if, look, for, hmm. For an average Australian looking to enter the property market for the first time, if the land tax reforms actually materialize in supplying more houses in the market, it means good news. Having said that, that also means that more and more people might just jump into the market. What we what we are currently seeing, people are anticipating a RBA rate cut and they're jumping into the housing market, assuming there'll be a rate cut and artificially inflating house prices. The same could happen in Victoria. It increases the supply for housing, uh, temporarily reducing the prices for houses. But the more and more people become aware of this happening and the more first home buyers enter the property market, it again pushes up the prices for housing. So in the near term, I think it's not really going to have much of a difference, but over the medium to long term, if this continues and the supply keeps improving and the demand normalizes, it will um, bring some, some balance to the property market in Victoria. Thank, thank you, Devika. Um, we might move to immigration quickly. Um, you, and you mentioned earlier that we've moved from um, not having access to any labour to now being very specific in our requirements or businesses' requirements to, to access um, specifically skilled labour. So mm. how can we get more 
migrants into the workforce? Because we have record levels of, of immigration to Australia at the moment. So it's funny, right? I mean, you would have thought record level of migration means the labor market problem gets completely solved. But there are a lot of um, there are a lot of other factors that influence migration as well as um, the absorption of new entrants into the Australian labor force. Number one are visa conditions. So for example, there might be some young students who are willing to work longer hours who have the right skill sets, but they're not able to work those stipulated hours because of visa restrictions. Student visas usually come with a lot of restrictions on the number of hours they can work. Secondly, there's another category of visa where um, you might be a dependent, but you may not be able to work. You may not be able, you may not be allowed to work because of set conditions on your visa. Uh, perhaps you are a spouse who's, uh, who's come to Australia, who's on a tourist visa, but you're not allowed to work on a tourist visa. So the time it takes for you to come from to go from a tourist visa to a potential partner visa or to a work visa or to a permanent residency, the longer it takes, the longer it takes for you to actually enter the uh, Australian labor force. Secondly, there is a general observation. Um, um, this is coming from the migrants, not necessarily from the businesses, is that even though they do have working rights, there is a slight hesitation for firms to hire anybody who does not have local experience. So the Australian experience is what is really um, valued in the Australian jobs market. So to give you an example, someone may be really, really good in the IT sector or let's let's take my example. I'm just three years old to Australia. I have been an economist covering other other economies and I understand economics and I know how that translates to the Australian sphere. It's just that I may not have looked at Australia as much as I have looked at other economies, but I needed someone to take that chance on me, someone like you, Jamie, who, who knew that, okay, there is the capability, she can do the job. It's just that maybe she needs to look at a different country. We need that approach. We need that openness that, yes, they do have the skill set. They may not have a local or fresh experience, but they definitely have that skill set to adjust, to transfer those skills to suit the Australian market. So we need more willingness from the businesses to absorb them. Secondly, on the on the government side, I would say we need to incentivize incentivize movement from capital cities to the regional areas in Australia. Regional areas in Australia have immense potential when it comes to really finding a good job. Unfortunately, for a new entrant into Australia, they would think, hmm, where, do, where will I find more opportunities? Is it in Sydney or is it in a regional town? They would obviously tend more towards Sydney. So we need to have policies in place which will incentivize people to move outside of capital cities more to the regional areas. So not only are we developing those regional areas, but we are also absorbing more and more migrants into the workforce. Thank you, thank you Devika. And a question here from James Commonwealth in Perth. And you mentioned uh, when, you, when you were talking about China and the shift in their economy from mm -hmm. property to manufacturing. And given that iron ores, you know, the, the, the largest export that we have from Australia, does that mean that China's appetite for iron ore will, re will reduce? And what impact will that have on Australia's economy? Well, it's the appetite is not going to reduce drastically. I would say it's a short term um, adjustment that China is doing in order to keep its economy running. If the real estate market is really not um, delivering on the economic front, it is simply shifting its focus, which means broadly for Australia, the focus also shifts from iron ore to lithium, which is another solid commodity for Australia. So broadly, I think the impact is not going to be severe. We are just going to be, we are just going to see a shift in the demand from one commodity to the other. So net net, the fall in the demand for iron ore might be offset by what happens in lithium, uh, increase in demand for lithium, but it should not broadly uh, really impact the mining sector too much. Iron ore is still predominantly uh, the choice of commodity for the Chinese market. Thank you. And there is a question from Michaela uh, Kivrich on lithium. In, so I will come into that now. And how would you, Devika, assess the current outlook for Australian lithium development industry and the main mm -hmm. companies in that area? 
Uh, I think it's Even very the positive. World demand for batteries. And, yes, mm. yes. I think I think the outlook for lithium currently is really positive. Um, let me start with China, and then I'll also show how that is developing in the rest of the world as well. So China is moving more and more to manufacturing, particularly in new energy vehicle space, which means they're pushing more and more people to invest in electric vehicles. So as the infrastructure gets developed to perhaps use electric vehicles more often, uh, there's growing uh, sentiment that electric vehicles are not only more fuel efficient, obviously the broader implication is that they're environmental friendly. So we are going to expect more push from various governments to adopt new energy vehicles, electric vehicles, which is definitely going to push up the demand for lithium in Australia and otherwise, not just in China, but we are already aware that the European market and the US market are also developing their own line of electric vehicles. So uh, Australia being one of the key uh, key producers of lithium, we have we stand to gain a lot from the current focus or the increasing focus on lithium. Thank you. And a question from Dennis Gillespie on skilled migration. Uh, mm -hmm. Has there been a shift in government policy from chasing specific skills to now really just a, a, a broader brush approach, maybe because of a less availability in, in the world market that's interested in, in immigrating to Australia? So has there been a shift in Australia's policy that you're aware of? Um, in fact, it's, there's been a seesaw. So when, when the Australian government opened its borders after the pandemic, it was come one, come all. But unfortunately, what over time we have realized that, uh, yes, it has solved the absolute unemployment problem. It has now given rise to the structural unemployment problem. It is now that the government is actually looking very closely at the candidates who are coming into Australia, whether it is students, they are focusing keenly on what are the courses those students are pursuing and whether they are suitable for the demand uh, among Australian businesses and among the working class who are coming into Australia on a working visa. The, the visa processing time for people who are in a high demand skilled um, sector the visa processing time is much shorter for someone who's coming on a more generalist skill visa. So the shift has been the other way around from being open for everyone to becoming more closed, more bespoke and more targeted to handle the demand from Australian businesses. Thank you, Devika. And here's a question from someone on the investment side. Given the increasing tensions in the Middle East that you referred to, and the weakness in the Chinese economy and the ongoing war in Ukraine, why is the Australian financial market at an all-time high? And I think that's to be read as the, the stock market. Yes. So, look, it's very hard to read the market, Jamie. Investor sentiment and risk appetite play a significant role in driving financial markets. Um, Despite geopolitical uncertainties, investors may be focusing more on potential opportunities and positive economic indicators rather than the risks, which leads to increased investment activity and higher market valuations. A simple example would be um, petrol prices are highly volatile. They definitely have a direct impact. Uh, crude oil prices, I mean, have a direct impact on the stock market up, down, up, down, daily price fluctuations. But broadly, if you look at it from the economic sense, um, if you look at petrol in the CPI basket, if everything else seems to be going down in Australia, inflation broadly is going down and fuel price is the only one that has been going up, it seems to offset the increased prices of fuel. So that could be, take, that could be seen as a positive by the market compared to just focusing or fixating on petrol prices alone. Thank you. A, a property question from Matthew Herrett from Link Property Services. And the question is about the release of land. So uh, much of land ha has been rezoned for development. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. Treasury appears not to be forthcoming with funds for services to infrastructure, which is needed as part of the, the development process. Do you have a view on Treasury's ability to fund land releases which are much needed to correct the demand and supply imbalance with residential and industrial asset classes. 
So they definitely have the tools to really um, improve the land supply, but then we also have to uh, look at it from a holistic um, point of view. Are we sure that improving the supply, depending on um, where the land's land is, are we sure we will be able to perhaps if you're just focusing on housing and we say that, yes, improving land supply will improve housing supply. Do we have enough schools in that area? Do we have enough resources in that area? Do we have enough infrastructure or solid infrastructure, whether it's roads or bridges or rails or any other mode of transport to connect those supply areas to the mainstream city or to any regional highly developed area to bridge that gap between you know, setting up a house uh, releasing land in, say, remote areas of Australia, which are otherwise cut off from general civilization. So it's not simply about just releasing land. It also means you have to understand how much of costs are going to be involved in developing the land as a whole, not just to solve the housing supply crisis. Yeah, thank you. And moving to manufacturing, there's a, a few questions that are coming pre the webinar and also one just has coming from Joe Patterson, which I'll come to. Will Australia mm -hmm. learn the lessons from COVID and start manufacturing here or restart manufacturing here? Uh, or is our future restricted to selling education to overseas students, tourism, digging dirt, and to some extent <laughs> agriculture, which may be a, a, um, a simplistic view of, of, of what Australia produces, but can Australia ever compete in manufacturing due to the high labour cost? and the very regulated uh, environment that we have compared to competitors. And Joe Patterson, I might add to that question, because I think it's, it, it all falls under the same banner, is how might the current economic trends impact Australian manufacturing operations in terms mm -hmm. of demand for our products, the cost mm -hmm. of production inputs, and the impact on international freight? Yes. So... Um, I'm not. Um, I mean, it, it's it's um, it's an interesting point that a couple of decades ago, Australia was actually a manufacturing stronghold. Um, it was a manufacturing economy, but we have since then transitioned more to a commodities-based economy. Having said that, of the last couple of uh, quarters, we are seeing as Australia's manufacturing sector has undergone significant evolution, increasing its contribution to overall GDP. Job losses, yes have been there, but they have been partially offset by the same people migrating to warehousing or logistics simply due to outsourcing or supply chain model changes. Um, yes, the industry does continue to face workforce challenges with a lack of vocational training to develop skilled labor and immense costs involved in developing R&D and infrastructure. But even if the progress to becoming self-sufficient is long drawn out, a good way to start would be by focusing on value adding to sectors that are already up and running, for example, mining, agriculture, enhancing supply chain sovereignty in so sectors such as pharma and defense. To boost competitiveness, I think Australia can definitely invest in specialized manufacturing, add value to our Australian exports and embrace more automation and innovation. Thanks. And I think that leads us into just a general increase in productivity and and the next question, which is a focus on improving productivity in Australia. What role do you see the tech sector playing to help with this? The tech sector plays a pivotal role in enhancing productivity across Australia by driving automation, um, any, any form of digital transformation, remote work enablement, and skills development. To give you a simple example, um, you develop an an AI model. And if you're a small business owner with say just five employees, if it used to take you six hours to draft a proposal, a business proposal, you train AI and you have a business proposal ready in two hours, which means you have freed up four hours of an individual's time during the work hours to dedicate that somewhere else. So not only is it solving the productivity problem, it's also solving the labor shortage problem. Um, through the development and implementation of automation technologies, uh, machine learning algorithms, the tech sector definitely streamlines processes. It definitely optimizes workflows and it will enable businesses to have higher efficiency levels. In fact, um, 
we recently heard from our assistant governor Brad Jones that tech is key to innovation and the more businesses particularly SMEs invest in innovation the greater the benefit for the Australian economy yes, it's not just a tech sector it's each business <laughs> taking a tech approach and thinking about how it goes about business a hundred percent uh, and that, that question was from Marvin, our National Head of Technology based in Melbourne. And going to, uh, I think we've got time for maybe two more questions, just looking at the clock. Uh, and, and the next is from Jayesh Kapitan, who's the National Head of our, of our Health Group. And mm -hmm. it, it, as we know, health is, is large and it's diverse with many variables that impact its operations. So, Devika, in your opinion, how will the wider global macroeconomic environment impact on mm -hmm. health sector operations, in particular, the inflation mm -hmm. pressure we're seeing on the supply chain, uh, mm -hmm. and also staff costs, which are a significant element for mm -hmm. all health sector services. So the health sector has been stretched since the pandemic. Um, additionally, rising demand for healthcare services post-pandemic in a rapidly aging demography is likely to drive up staff costs as organizations compete for talent and we have more regulatory changes and evolving funding models. So until the supply of well-qualified healthcare workers improves, we can expect labor input costs in the health sector to remain elevated. Um, Inflationary, other broad inflationary pressures may lead to increased input costs for essential medical supplies and equipment, uh, which will necess necessitate adjustments in procurement strategies and supplier relationships. I think it would be a good time to perhaps build that rapport with your supplier to negotiate some better uh, prices for sourcing your um, sourcing your uh, medical supplies. And this is separate to what the hurdles are from the labor front. To mitigate these challenges, I think um, a very general um, input from my side would be to employ proactive strategies such as cost containment measures, workforce optimization. Again, we can benefit a lot from the tech sector uh, going into the medical field. Um, and we definitely, I think another good way would be to advocate policy intervention and industry partnerships to ensure that the sustainability of the healthcare delivery remains consistent despite economic uncertainties. Uh, Jamie, you're on mute, sorry. Yeah, thanks, Devika. And the final question, is from Kath Bell, a partner in our Perth office. And it's on the topic of baby boomers. And I don't think Kathy the baby boomer, but uh, she still posts this question. We're seeing many of the baby boomers retire now. How will mm -hmm. Australia's demographics impact our economy? So I, I think the, the growing um, population of retirees and the lower uh, reproduction rates that we're seeing, how will that, how will that impact Australia? Um, thanks, Kat. That's a very, very good question. Um, so the baby boomers are retiring. That is definitely going to bring a significant shift in the psyche of how the next generation of Australian workforce is. Um, given what we are seeing in the preferences with the new grads coming in versus um, what the senior employees we see around us is that the older generation prefers more uh, working in the office. The younger generation wants more flexibility. They are more mindful of the environmental damages um, that constitute, say, perhaps traveling every day, using your own car, burning more fuel. So we can expect uh, perhaps greater understanding and greater flexibility around how uh, around the work culture. Um, what that might mean is we adopt more and more technology broader implication for the Australian economy means more acceptance for technological advancements, higher efficiency, despite working lesser number of hours, and definitely an increased awareness towards how we are heading on the environment side. I think the younger generation is really focused on making sure that we do safeguard the environment in the pursuit of greater development. So uh, I believe the, the the shift in the psyche is going to be felt in the environmental sector, in the tech sector, and definitely in the office working culture. That's great. Thank you, Devika. Well, look, I think that's really all we have time for today. We've got a little bit over. Devika, mm -hmm. on behalf of, of the audience today, thank you for sharing your insights. Thank you for uh, doing the, 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 uh, the, the, the large overview 
of the macroeconomic conditions impacting Australia and the world for that matter, but also for some of the deep dives you did into different industry sectors and, and, and different areas. Uh, to the audience, um, thank you very much for, for sharing um, questions and participating in the last hour. Uh, there are some questions that have come through on stage three tax cuts, on federal government uh, posturing on the on 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 the on the tensions between uh, the the prime minister's um, pressure to, to re reduce household budgets and the treasurer's pressure to uh, deliver a surplus in the budget. Uh, that's all ahead of us in two weeks, and we are we do have a a webinar that Devika will be a guest speaker on and. If Jordan could put, thanks Jordan, putting the uh, the 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 QR code for those of you that may might be interested. That's on uh, Wednesday in two weeks' time, uh, where we will unpack uh, the what what the federal uh, budget means from a tax perspective, but also from an economic perspective. So, uh, thank you everybody, and we look forward to hosting the next of these probably in August. Thank you.